All right, so today I want to cover ball pythons for the absolute beginner. If you're at a reptile show, maybe you're at a reptile store and you're looking through the videos on your phone trying to figure out, hey, is a ball python really what I want for, for a long-term pet? This video is hopefully going to cover everything about the entry level of ball pythons. And this is, this is a ball python around my neck. This is Bobby. He is a bamboo ball python. And this is probably about as big as a ball python will get. They won't get much bigger than this. I've seen some females that are a little bit bigger, but you'd be hard pressed to really find something bigger than this. And probably the first thing you notice, this is this guy is wrapping around my neck. And a lot of people say, hey, that, that snake's going to hurt you. And really for a full size, for a full grown adult like I am, this, this snake can kind of choke me a little bit, but it's not going to really do any damage. This snake doesn't have enough power. It'll, it'll take my breath away, but it really, I don't know what Bobby's doing, choking me again, but uh, he, he really can't hurt me at all, squeezing around my neck. It's it's pretty, uh, a non, it's, it's a harmless reptile. It really can't do any damage. But on the flip side, if you're showing these snakes to like toddlers or young kids, you know, kids that are a little bit smaller, I would definitely supervise, make sure the snake doesn't wrap around their neck because you don't want anything bad to happen. Uh, uh, it's, I would say they have some power, but for a full grown adult, you're probably okay. I would definitely supervise around kids, or, or if you have them around kids, I wouldn't wrap them around my neck. I'd probably just, just kind of hold them. And ball pythons are the most docile of all snakes that you can get. I can guarantee you this snake will not bite me. I know Bobby. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that said, hey, has Bobby ever tried to bite you? You know, coming up on your neck and kind of giving you kisses and everything. And this snake has never ever attempted to bite me. And it's, it's probably a double-edged sword for ball pythons. One of the pros is that they hardly will ever bite unless they're uh, like a really traumatized snake or if they're a young hatchling a lot of times they can be a little snippy but usually once they get to adult size it's it's hardly ever a problem as far as the ball python biting you but on the flip side it's uh, probably one of the most difficult ball pythons to get to actually eat rodents and pretty much there's only one thing on the menu can't feed them hot dogs or anything like that the, uh, the only thing that these guys will eat are rats or mice and a lot of people actually you know, for a full-size ball python like this, typically I'd say, you know, most people would feed like a frozen thawed rat that you keep in your freezer. You thaw it out and then you warm it up to about 100 degrees, 110 degrees, and then you feed it to them. And probably the biggest thing for ball pythons is, is you feed them week after week after week. And a lot of times you'll be like thawing out the rodents offering and then throwing the rodent away because they won't eat. That's probably the biggest problem when they go on a fast. And I've actually had ball pythons go on a fast for up to a year and a half. And let me tell you, that is a lot of, you know, rodents that you have to throw away if they don't eat them. And essentially what I did is, is I actually got to the point where I'm feeding half of my collection. I have probably anywhere from 50 to 150 ball pythons in this room since, since I breed them. I, I produce about 100 hatchlings a year. And essentially what I do is I'll feed a portion of my ball pythons. If they don't eat, I'll feed them to the rest of the ball pythons. So I won't feed them all at once. So I end up with all these extra rats. And then I kind of mark on the tubs which one I know are gonna eat and which ones probably won't eat. And then it helps me kind of balance my flow of rodents going through. So essentially, I don't I don't really waste any rodents in my operation here. And what I usually do is I don't usually do a frozen thought. I do a euthanization with CO2 and then feed them that way. And if they don't eat, I pop them in the freezer and then sell them to the pet store. That's, uh, that's another option. But I'd say probably the biggest thing as far as getting a pet snake is, is having to feed rodents either frozen thawed or live. Sometimes some of these ball pythons will get stuck where they'll only feed on live. And I have, I've, I actually have a, quite a few. I think I have like three or four that will only eat live. And I'll try again and again and again to feed like a frozen thawed or a fresh kill. And then uh, after months and months and months, they won't eat. I'll follow up with a small live rat. And then usually they'll actually take the small rat, which is kind of interesting. It's kind of old. Bobby's almost, almost fell off my shoulder here. So that's probably, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest hurdles 
as far as getting a ball python, a lot of people they really can't feed the the even sometimes sometimes people even have a problem feeding like a frozen thawed rat. They don't really want to feed any kind of an animal to another animal, and that's that's another thing you have to consider when you're getting into ball pythons. I actually tried to feed them hot dogs, and they won't eat hot dogs. As a matter of fact, they do have. Uh, a reptilink that some snakes will take some are really aggressive feeders and will actually kind of like a hot dog style kind of a, a link that you feed them and I would say only the really extreme aggressive snakes will eat something like that I think mostly they're geared towards lizards and monitors and stuff like that they'll eat pretty much anything but I, as far as the ball python I would say I've only ever seen people feed rats and mice and the other thing you really have to watch on ball pythons is the shed. So for example, Bobby here, he's going into a shed. He's fading out a little bit. The eyes kind of get gray and you really need to boost the humidity in their enclosure or in the room. And what I use here is a little humidifier as well as a coconut husk substrate in the enclosure. And I'd say the coconut husk is probably the number one substrate as far as is giving snakes a really good shed. And I'd highly recommend like a pro cocoa or a repta chip substrate, something like that where they can they can have a really good shed. So probably I'd say probably the number one things as far as a beginner is concerned. Number one is the feeding issue. Is it can be kind of nerve wracking, especially for a beginner. If you buy a snake and it won't eat for months and months. And I'd say uh, a snake like Bobby here, he could probably go up to two years without food and still survive. <laughs> he get pretty thin. It's probably not good for him. But I feed I feed him pretty much once a month now once every month and a half and I'll give him a few decent sized rodents and then he'll take a break from being in front of the camera because usually if you feed them you don't want to handle them for at least I'd say 48 hours or you risk them regurgitating and you definitely don't want that especially if you have a real picky eater and you finally get it to eat after a couple months you don't want to mess with that snake some people say don't mess with them for a week because you want them to digest really good so they don't regurgitate that meal so I'd say <laughs> ball pythons are probably one of the easiest pets. You know, uh, it's it's really good pet for going on vacation. If you go on vacation a lot, you know, especially if you're going for several days at a time, it's not like a dog or a cat that you have to constantly feed and watch and have someone come and watch your pet snake. It's not really like that. You can actually take this ball python. Put them, I put them in these racks and these tubs and close them up. You could actually put them in there for two weeks straight without even looking at them and they would be perfectly fine. So these guys are really, I'd say, pretty tropical. The temperatures really have to be in, on the low side, I'd say mid 70s. And on the hot spot, I'd say uh, probably a maximum of 90 degrees. So you really can't have them really too cold like some snakes. So for, for example, for a king snake, you can actually let it get a lot colder uh, the, sometimes they go into a brumation. Ball pythons don't brumate, so you don't have to worry about anything like a hibernation or anything like that with ball pythons. Essentially, they come from West Africa, and in West Africa, if you, if you actually look at the temperature in West Africa, it is way over 100 degrees most of the year. It is really hot, and these guys actually burrow under the termite mounds. They use like rodent holes under the termite mounds to actually escape the daytime heat and stay cool, and they come out at night. They're pretty much a nocturnal animal which is pretty interesting so what you really need for a ball python as far as an enclosure I'd say you need something where they can totally get their whole body in the dark all the time so so for example for a ball python like this you'd want something you'd want to hide that completely covers the whole ball python which is which is which would be a pretty big hide and what I like to do is I like to use these tubs behind me and the tubs act as the hide so so essentially the whole snake in the tub is completely in the dark and that is what you want so if you, if you get a ball python and he's pacing back and forth in your aquarium or your enclosure with a window and he's just always trying to get out and not eating, that is an indication that you don't have the proper setup and really what you want is you want a hide that completely encloses 
the ball python is preferably something that is completely enclosed with just one hole on the front so they can actually get out and escape with just one little hole it's it's, it's almost like I'd say kind of like a birdhouse enclosure, something like that, but it has to be on the ground like one of those round hides with just a hole on the front. That would be ideal. Or you could go to like a tub kind of a setup, something like that. So I'd say if you're thinking about getting a ball python, it is, it is a really fun pet, really low maintenance. I have hundreds of snakes. It doesn't really take a whole lot of time to go through and clean and feed these guys. It does take some time here on a larger scale, but if you're thinking about just getting one, it's it's not really that big of a deal. And then if you have pretty much an unlimited budget and you can buy you know any snake that you wanted, you go to Reptile Show. There are amazing, a dizzying array of colors and patterns as far as what you can buy in a ball python. That's another, another thing. And for me as a breeder, there's like 300 base morphs and I can breed all those different colors and patterns together to produce some stuff that has never been seen before. It's always, you're always looking at the world's first ball python. It's really exciting. You know, there's a lot of money involved sometimes. Some people are going after the money. And I think me, for me, it's more of creating something new and exciting, seeing what the potential is for something some of these genes like I can mix my bamboo with a clown and maybe nobody's made certain combos before and I could go after those combos and make some stuff that nobody in the whole world has ever made it's pretty exciting and it's like you're an artist just painting a picture on the snake of all these different genes and bringing them together and seeing what you can get it's pretty awesome so that is pretty much beginner ball python in a nutshell. If you're thinking about getting a ball python, I would first look at the prices of the enclosures. Make sure you have the proper enclosure, the proper substrate. I would go with a coconut husk substrate, some kind of a hide that they can completely get into so they're not uh, exposed. That's probably the biggest thing. They also need a heat mat on a thermostat on the hot end, something that you can set to 90 degrees. But other than that, it is pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. You want to make sure you have the right setup and the right enclosure and everything before you actually buy the ball python. I've seen a lot of people walking around the reptile shows with their ball python and they're like, oh, well, now I need a setup. What do I need? And I would say the first thing you really need to do is I would go to you know, a lot of these reptile shows actually have people that specialize in the setups. So I would go over and pick out your ball python. Before you actually pay for it, I would go over and look at the setups, see if you can get a really good setup and how much that costs in addition to the ball python, put it all together and then figure out how much it's really gonna cost. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.